Hey friends, I'm excited to get into the interview with Shane Claiborne, but before I do, I wanted to let you know about my upcoming book that's being released in the springtime called Echoing Hope, How the Humanity of Jesus Redeems Our Pain. Right now, you can check out a free sort of sample of the book on the website, and the website, by the way, is echoinghope.com. And on there, you'll be able to read the foreword from Scott McKnight, plus the introduction and the first chapter, and also get a feel for the flow of the book with the table of contents and all of that good stuff. I'm excited to share this first book that I've ever written with you all. And so I hope you'll consider checking it out. You can go to echoinghope.com. That's echoinghope.com. Welcome to Theology Curator, a podcast hosted by Kurt Willems and available online at TheologyCurator.com. Each episode looks at a theological, formational, or cultural theme. We might dig into the life and letters of a radical Jewish teacher named Paul, converse about a pressing contemporary issue, reflect on the nature of following Jesus today, or even attempt to remedy doom and gloom preaching with a good old-fashioned dose of hope. This show is an invitation to build bridges between the first century world of the earliest Christ followers into the 21st century reality we now inhabit. The Jesus we excavate from the rubble of tradition might just surprise us all. I want to welcome you back to Theology Curator. My name is Kurt Willems. I'm the host. And today I am with Daniel Hill. And he is an author, a pastor. And one of the topics he talks about is racial justice and um, how the white, um, how white Christians can step into that conversation and into that life Um well, I suppose you'd say. And so he has a book called White Awake, An Honest Look at What It Means to Be White. And his brand new book that came out September 1st is White Lies, Nine Ways to Expose and Resist the Racial Systems That Divide Us. Daniel, so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you, Kurt. It's, I've followed your stuff for a long time, so it's an honor to be on your show, on your podcast. Oh, so, so grateful. So grateful. And, you know, I, I'm really excited to have you on, on this uh, particular topic. You know, I've had other people that I've talked with that of course are stepping in and leading courageously around issues of race and how that relates to um, being the people of God and the local church and all of those things. And I'd be um, curious to hear some of your story and some of your background as far as how you came into ministry and how this journey um, really unfolded for you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm a Chicago guy. I've been in Chicago all my life. I'm one of the, I always thought I'd move, never got out. So at 47, yeah. I think I'm probably here. <laughs> <Forget> <laughs> um, I'm a pastor's kid. Um, dad was actually, my dad was actually a fairly famous scholar, even Greek and Hebrew scholar. So I grew up not only deep in kind of what I think we'd probably call evangelical world now, but one that was, <laughs> I know this can't possibly be the case, but literally the first word I remember saying was not mama or dada or anything like that. The first word I remember saying is dikaiosune. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So that's the kind of, yeah. that's the kind of thick religious home I was in. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of what we're all reacting against now in terms of like what the evangelical church has become and has lost its way, you know, it's, it's something that hits very close to home. It's kind of my own upbringing experience. And so, hmm. you know, I, I went far from church during high school and college and um, when the business world was part of a handful of um, dot coms back in the mid nineties when those were popping like crazy and ended up just kind of by chance with one of the dot coms I was part of um, moving by Willow Creek Community Church, a large mega church out in the suburbs of Chicago. And mm-hmm. long story short, that's kind of where I ended up coming back to faith and where I ended up working for a big part of my 20s. And so that's where I kind of learned about pastoral leadership, I guess, from a very different standpoint than the kind of environment I grew up in. And that's also the environment where um, my racial awakening journey began and uh, ultimately would let me leaving there, kind of planting this church because, you know, I felt kind of compelled to go much deeper into it than I probably had any chance of going in a, you know, white homogenous setting. So that was yeah. January, January of 2003 that I left there to plant this church where I'm at now in River City, which is in the Humble Park neighborhood of Chicago, which is one of 77 neighborhoods in Chicago. And the neighborhood's about half black and half Latino, Latinx, um, historically poor. So yeah, we've been here now 17 and a half years kind of doing church work in this environment. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's an inspiring journey. I mean, you you clearly had such an awakening that 
you're willing to step into a context that would be quite different from anything you've probably ever experienced as far as like life rhythms, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Hmm. Well, I am really curious to hear about. So you you planted in 2003. What What's your church called again? River City Community Church. River City. That's right. River City. Yes. Um, so you planted River City uh, in 2003. And you flesh this out a little bit. So what, what happens? What is that process like for you when it comes to activating some of those passions? Well, you know, one of the benefits I had during my season at Willow is they let me start a campus ministry or a campus of Willow in the city. Um, and my intention at that point, too, was to deal with race and social justice. Um, and there's kind of a whole story in that. Yeah. You know, I, I chronicle a lot of that in wide awake. And, uh, but bottom line, what I realized was that I didn't even know what I was talking about when I talked about the problem of race. Um, and that I had no concept theologically of how to even think about it or address it. And so there's this kind of schism in me where I cared deeply about the Bible and following Jesus and seeing Jesus was supreme over all things. I could see at some level that rate, the problem of race was one that was really significant and had very significant impact on people. And yet I could see that I just was not positioned to theologically understand or respond to it. And so the purpose of the church, I kind of, I kind of still had a savior mentality when I started the ministry through Willow and I got smacked in between the eyeballs on that one and on just a hundred different ways. And so when I started this church, I wasn't even sure it was going to help anybody anymore at that point. It was really just necessary for me to go deeper into my own theological journey of understanding how to think about race. Um, and I just needed to be in a neighborhood, in a community where I didn't have to go search for it, right? It was, you know, in the city and that's especially yeah. that part of the city. It was everywhere, you know? And so, um, I knew that it was a it was a learning journey I was on, and I just wanted that to be kind of front and center of the church. And I also knew that if I couldn't build, um, you know, culture a racially diverse leadership team, I probably didn't belong doing this kind of work anyway. So, you know, it was kind of the everything at Willow had been about big and fast, and was, you know, it's kind of in the kind of prototypical church growth model. And I knew in this one it would be slow and painful. And oh yeah. Uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but that I'd be measuring success for myself in a very different way. It'd be much more around enlightenment and kind of seeing that which I couldn't currently see. Um, so yeah, j everything about it was different. Wow. Wow. And you, you really go into that in wide awake. Um, and I'm curious for, for folks who would be curious, I'm curious for folks who'd be curious. What am I saying? I'm curious well, I about think it, that it works. It doesn't sound, uh, it, it, I, I'm following you. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. But I am curious about, um, that book. If you would be willing to give just kind of an overview of some of what you deal with in that first book and sort of the aims and goals of that first one, and then we'll try transition to your uh, brand new one, White Lies? Yeah, what White Awake, um, I, I, I think that the system of race is so profound, and I think it's sustained by supernatural evil, and, and you know, so, so much of how evil works through lies and through chaos, uh, yeah. right? And I, I think that to be white and to have a racial awakening is one of the most confusing things that there is, um, because being white in a context that's kind of in an environment that's driven by white supremacy um, means we're surrounded by this really evil system all the time, but we kind of learn to not pay attention to it. We learn to filter it out. We learn to screen it out. Even go so far to say that's part of the agenda of the evil behind it is to keep us from thinking about it. So when that light bulb, so to speak, that's a phrase that gets used a lot, right? When the light bulb turns on, you know, as it did for me at Willow Creek, I think a mistake a lot of us who are white make is that once we see it, once the light bulb goes on, that we're actually deep in the process. <laughs> I actually think more honestly, when the light bulb goes on, that's kind of day one. That's step yeah, one. Yeah, right? wow. So a lot of us spend our whole adult lives never getting to day one. And then all of a sudden day one comes where the light bulb comes on. And if you're going to become serious about it, particularly from a faith perspective, I think it's going to be super, super disorienting. And there's going to be all these kind of conditioned defense mechanisms that pop up to, to stop you from moving forward on it. So that's really the purpose of White Awake. It's really kind of walking with a white Christian who's ready to learn about race and to see kind of how deep it goes, especially from a Jesus-centric perspective. Um, and to kind of attend to the inevitable and pretty s somewhat common defense mechanisms that tend to come up for those of us who are white when we start to take this seriously. Yeah, that's that's a really helpful summary. And uh, it's something that again and again, I think people uh, who are white, who have this sort of aha moment for some, I mean, George Floyd, that was their first aha moment, you know, right. 
and it is thoroughly disorienting. I mean, I hear this over and over again, but many of many of the people I've been kind of observing in life and online, mostly since we're in quarantine, um, has been a real there's a real desire to know more and to know and 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 also probably an Im- impulse to fix which is a pretty <laughs> a pretty white thing i think at times uh we got to fix this quick but but i i do see this sort of um need for a resource that walks people through like the depths of that journey rather than just yeah. oh my gosh i feel bad about this and so i'm going to yeah. maybe say words about it you know mhm yeah so so i i appreciate that and and your new book is kind of like in, as I understand it, kind of like the next stage of your sort of, um, like, I don't know, I, it, it kind of gets at some of the myths that um, really hold white people back from stepping into um, racial justice and reconciliation work, it sounds like. So, mm-hmm. so talk to me about the vision of uh, this new book and um, what you hope for as far as um, when people read it, what you hope they take from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, if I think of where I hope somebody's at at the end of a the white awake journey, particularly for the white Christian, you know, I, I do this stuff in spaces that are not faith-based too, but, you know, I do have a particular uh inclination towards doing this from a faith base because i think it's all wrapped around jesus and his lordship overall and the coming kingdom of christ so you know when i think of what i would hope somebody's at when they begin this racial awakening journey i would hope that they would get to a point as a christian where they would say i literally cannot love jesus without hating white supremacy i wow, literally cannot yeah. follow jesus and seek his kingdom without also seeking to dismantle and uproot white supremacy like those need to become unshakable convictions, not what's the more common discourse of, I kind of care about race, but what about critical race theory? I kind of care mm-hmm. about race, but I don't I don't like the agenda of Black Lives Matter. I kind of care about race, but it's becoming a really political issue, right? Like n- nobody's going to move at all, um, you know, when they're still getting stuck in those places. And so the hope of with White Awake is that they get to the point where it's like, I can't love Jesus without hating white supremacy. I have to do you know, I have to move on this. Like, that's really where white lies then picks up. It says, once mm. you've come to that conviction that you can't love Jesus without hating white supremacy, that you have to be part of the confrontation and uprooting of it. How does a white Christian show up? Like, what is the right posture? What, where do you go with that? You know, unfortunately, I wish it was as simple as saying that conviction is all we need. But the truth is, we can have that conviction and still do a lot of damage, you know, um, if we try to like lead, think yeah. ourselves or fix things we don't understand, you know. And so white lies really picks up at that point saying, once you've come to that point where you really have that conviction and can't not do something, you know, what are practices, what are ways you can kind of organize yourself and learn from those who have gone before us? And really for me, you know, white lies, there's not an idea in there that's original to me. It's all what black and brown mentors have been, you know, investing into me along the way saying, here's how we want you to show up, or here's how you showed up that was wrong and how we think you can yeah, to that and show up, but a different kind of way, right? Like there's just, there's just no, you know, there's just no way of kind of learning this stuff without some of that trial and error and making mistakes. So that's where white lies really becomes unique is kind of picking up uh, at the point where you already have that deep conviction. You almost have to do something. Yeah, that's, yeah, that seems so helpful and practical um, and challenging. And, you know, this is the kind of book that really forces white people like myself to have to actually be confronted by the lies that I don't want to let go of. Or the lies that I I didn't know were lies, and right. that's uh that's that that's hard work. That's um that's a commitment to um, doing some real hard work. And so to have a guide through some of that is just I think awesome, just so helpful. And yeah, no, yeah, I, I sincerely mean that. And and I'm thinking about thinking about white Christians in particular in. Well, we'll just say the United States. I was going to say North America, but especially the United States. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm thinking about the white Christian when faced with the idea of racial injustice, inequity, bias, etc. And I'm curious what you might name as some of the biggest hurdles to get them to actually see that. Um, there's something beyond their white lenses, so to speak, and to be open to the conversation. Because I think, I think that's unfortunately, like you've said a second ago, it's become very polarized and political, politicized, and um, people 
watching weird videos from Fox pundits <laughs> about critical race theory and the agenda of Black Lives Matter and it's all going to make America communist. I mean, there's just so much information out there that if I'm white and I'm in a situation where I don't want to look at some of this stuff, all I have to do is find someone right. else who's saying something I like and it makes me feel better, right. which, you know, there's problems in whiteness about that. So so I'm curious, what are some of those hurdles that uh, you've noticed in um, Christian uh, Christian persons who are white? Well, if we went right to the Christian one, which I think is great to do, I would I would actually say like there's just an absolutely profound theological hurdle that most of us don't even realize is there. Um, it, it is so commonplace, especially especially like on if you're kind of tipping towards a more conservative Bible believing side of the white of the white church. I think the progressive mm-hmm. church tends to like struggle with a different manifestation of it, but in most in most white Christian spaces, they just plainly don't see this as something that matters deeply to Jesus. Yeah. They see it as a social issue, as an extracurricular issue, as something that's probably valid and important for some people to take on, right? What they don't see it as, as a front and center issue to Jesus, which to me is one of the signs of just like how far reaching the bill of good is that what bill of goods is that we've received you know even the terminology i you know people get so nervous about the term white supremacy and they react so strongly to it and i actually understand why because that's often associated with the most extreme violent forms of it you know so they'll respond i'm like but just right there if you realize right your starting point as a christian and this would be true of every christian in a conservative white space especially right your starting point is kind of what apostle paul says in colossians one right that jesus christ is the image of the invisible god and that his purpose in all things is to have supremacy right? To have supremacy over Whoa. all things. Like that's what yeah. Jesus declares for himself is to be supreme over all things, right? Now here's this ideology that manifests in itself in all these evil systems. And in its very declaration of itself, it says, no, we, I d- have claimed supremacy over all things. Whiteness is going to be what, decla- what proclaims supremacy over things. Race is going to be what proclaims supremacy over all things. Like it's literally in its name, right? Like the yeah. idolatry, the false godness of it is literally in its name, you know? And I, I truly do believe this. I mean, there's a lot of things we need to be conscious of as Christians, you know, but I think the ideology of white supremacy in my mind, I mean, all you have to do is look at history to see and look at the church and the division of the church and how this never ends. I don't think there's a close second to what ideology, what principality, what evil system is trying to dethrone Jesus Christ and take lordship upon itself. And so, um, for me, you, you, you couldn't even have a beginning conversation being a Christian without trying to understand how the ideology and systemic expression of white supremacy is trying to dislocate Jesus from the throne. But in most white churches, like that's not even something like that would like every single part of what we just said there would be like, wait, what? What? Right, like, right, like, and, yeah. and this is to me where there's a huge schism because if you're organized around trying to be a good disciple and follow Jesus and do what he wants you to do, and you don't think white supremacy falls anywhere within the locus of what a disciple should be doing, then it actually logically makes sense that you would care about it very much. Right. But the reverse is true too. If you saw it as the primary challenger to the throne of Jesus Christ, then you'd be thinking about it as often as the black church thinks about it, right? You would you would be mm. thinking about it as often as other people who see that for what it is think about it. So, like, I think we can go right to the root and say, like, how we think about Jesus and his gospel and the coming kingdom, like that. that that's 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 probably the number one problem facing those of us who grew up in white Christian spaces. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I I love that you went to the theological and the vision of who is this God that is revealed by Jesus, right? Like, I I think there's a lot there. And when we talk about white supremacy, um, you know, for someone who is maybe more reactive to that language, you know, it's hard. I, I find that for a lot of us, it's hard to think in systems because we've been so reared and geared towards the individual freedom impulse that mm-hmm. that we don't really see systems. And so when you start talking about um, dismantling white supremacy or dismantling systemic racism, a lot of folks are like, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. So so help us understand a little bit, like uh, dip our toes into the water, so to speak, on what, what we're talking about when we talk about white supremacy. I think the most brilliant orator on white supremacy and how it functionally works that's alive right now is Brian Stevenson. Are you familiar with his work, Kurt? The oh, guy absolutely. The, the yeah. So mm-hmm. he's somebody I think everybody should familiarize themselves. You know, he's much more famous now that, that you know Just Mercy came out last year, which was a wonderful film. Mm-hmm. Michael B. Jordan plays the role of Stevenson, and Jamie Jamie Fox of uh, 
the character of the man who was falsely uh, accused and so put powerful. Oh. So powerful. So, Thing that they're doing at Equal Justice Initiative. Another thing, I mean, you guys are on the other side of the country of this, but you know, he's got two museums in um, Montgomery, Alabama. One that tells the history of slavery, and one that bears witness to the six thousand plus black people who've been killed through lynching. Um, and um, it's two of the most uh, visceral experiences I think somebody could ever go through. And you just you just learn so much um, by being in those two museums. So we we take an annual pilgrimage from our church, which is you know what two thirds closer. So I know that's harder for Seattle. Although I'm yeah, sure yeah. Here in Seattle, but um, he he ties everything both in the in the slavery museum and in the lynching museum. He ties everything back to this phrase he uses called the narrative of racial hierarchy. Hmm. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but the narrative of racial hierarchy. And if you split it into two, it's not. I mean, you can almost deduce what they mean. It's one of the reasons I think he's such a brilliant thinker on this. So a narrative is a story, right? Um, you know, uh, we just did, uh, my colleague Shamika Pickett and I just did a, a, a training this week with a group of CEOs um, from across actually Europe. So. Um, that are trying wow. to understand white supremacy in the U S and how it's even playing out there. And we talked about this, about Brian Stevenson's phrase, the narrative racial hierarchy. And one of the CEOs uh, is in marketing. He said, you know, the golden standard in the advertising world is to come up with a narrative, to come up with a viral narrative that, you know, a story about a certain product or certain thing that mm-hmm. becomes transmitted from person to person, to person, to person, right? Like this registers so deeply from this idea of a narrative, right? That's a narrative of racial hierarchy. That's the second part. It's this story that says human value is not based on the Imago Dei, which would be the starting point for Christianity, right? That who we are as men and women made in the image and likeness of God, that's where our inherent dignity and value comes from. Um, the system of race, the story, the, the narrative of racial hierarchy says, no, your, your value does not come from the Imago Dei. It comes from where you fall on this racial hierarchy. Hmm. And the system of race, which just about all race scholars would agree is about 500 years old, very tied to colonialism and to slavery. The system of race had to organize around the growing level of inequality and oppression and dehumanization that was required to make slavery work. And so all the European groups are here, because of course, none of us were called white when we got to the United States. We were, you know, we were Polish or French Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. Italian or British or Irish, right? Um, But this system of white was created, which was always the top of the racial hierarchy. Black was always at the bottom. Um, Black was not just seen as less than. Black was inherently thought of as subhuman. That was the narrative behind blackness, is that you're subhuman, you're less than human. When Taxation was argued in the Constitution. Black people were called three-fifths human, which is a really kind of clear way of describing this narrative of racial mm-hmm. hierarchy that Brian Stevens is talking about, right? That white is five-fifths human, black is three-fifths human. And then whether it's Latinx, you know, um, different Asian American groups, their value, according to the narrative, not according to God, of course, but according to the narrative, their value is measured based on their proximity to whiteness and their proximity to blackness. And the more that they're painted in proximity to blackness, they're going to be seen as less than and dangerous and the more they can be painted as proximate to whiteness, they're going to be seen as achieving and worthy. And so Brian Stevens would say, and I would agree that this is the operating system of white supremacy. It is this narrative. It is this story, a false story built on lies, which is why it's a inherently Christian idea, right? Because that's what Christians should do is point to truth and expose lies. But the system of race, white supremacy is built on this narrative, this storyline of human value being tied to a racial hierarchy. So what he shows is like you can't understand slavery without that. What he shows is you can't understand this history of legacy without that. What he shows is you can't understand the, dif- the, the differentials in the incarceration system, the judicial system without understanding life. It's this story that just passes from generation to generation to generation that says the supreme, the, the, the most superior aspects of human nature are found in white people. The lowest, most base levels of humanity are seen in black people and everybody else is kind of their value, their intelligence, their proficiency, their capabilities all found within – the proximity between those two poles. And astonishingly, the story doesn't sound much different now. The narrative doesn't sound much different now than it did in the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1900s. It's, it's literally the most effective viral campaign that there's ever been, right? This, this narrative that human value is not tied to Imago Dei. It's tied to where somebody falls on the racial hierarchy. Yeah. Wow. That is so helpful. And I love how you tied Brian Stevenson into that because I think that that narrative language really helps us have some handles for how to think about this. And, um, you know, based on what you've just said, um, I, you know, folks, my, I, I know folks are tempted to say often, you know, that's true of our history, but that's not how I was raised or that's true of my history of, of U S history, but the civil rights happened, you know? And so I'm curious about, um, some of those sorts of impulses, right. That people will have. Um, and then I have some 
other questions that are a little <laughs> different direction from here. But I just want to know sort of, yeah, how do we, how, how do we hold that when those questions arrive? Yeah, well, I actually, the, the, your depiction of it would actually be a lot more progress than what I typically run into. I don't usually even run into people who say, yes, that's true. That's our history. That's our starting point. But it's, I do hear that it's not true of me. It's not true of my family. But I actually, I, I think this is some of where we get into trouble even collectively is in, in our in our national context, we are super good at like telling triumph stories and victory stories. And we're super bad at like acknowledging the brokenness and the dark parts of our history. And so, I mean, even I'm not trying to be political at all. This is certainly not partisan, uh, you know, but even just recently, there's been all this rhetoric from the white house of anything that's anti-racist literature is seen as un-American and it's, it's, you know, being pulled, you know, uh, funding is being risked by taking oil from that. Yeah. I, I actually think it's emblematic how we have, t- how we typically as a country deal with some of the demons around this narrative of racial hierarchy. Um, Cause it actually is not as hard to make the jump. If you can actually say that is what's been true of our country, it's not as hard to make the jump to the personal, because you can say if it was true at a national level, why wouldn't it have been true at a family level or an individual level? You know, what have I done to inoculate myself from the lies that are there in the broader society? But for most white folks I work with, they can't, they're, they're not, that's part of the disorientation process is they've been kind of told history in such a way that it's exempt from really dealing with the persistent nature of the lies. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, uh, I think true of my experience too, in some conversation that, um, that early disorientation. And and the question I think for some folks is what are you going to do with that disorientation? You know, are you going to lean into these things that make no sense right now and just explore and, you know, allow yourself to be open to some, yeah, another narrative. I mean, we have so many um, black sisters and brothers that are being um, very clear about these issues. Uh, followers of Jesus, evangel. We have conservative evangelical black pastors who are very clear about these things, and it's like we've got to at least give them the the time of day to to hear their narrative because our narrative might not be the full picture. And so I I appreciate you unpacking that. And, and I'm thinking now of the book because your book, it's, it's, it's the follow-up. It's that post disorientation in a lot of ways, you know, and, and you're, you're talking about white supremacy as a framework, but you quickly go into a word, um, wokeness, right? You, you talk about Mm -hmm. being woke and you're basically like, stop, like, don't do that. And, and I'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit with the, I, I, I say this to authors a lot, like, of course, like, don't go so far that the book is no longer relevant because we just heard you read it. But, but, you know, just as a general sort of sense that you have and what you're trying to accomplish here, what's wokeness for those who don't know? And why is it something that white folks should stop? <laughs> Yeah, well, we talked earlier in the conversation about the difference between white awake and white lies, right? So it, even our conversations reflecting the two different trajectories. So in white lies, we're trying to do what you and I just a minute ago were talking about, of like moving somebody who's apathetic about this, who doesn't really even see that the lies are real, who doesn't even see the race as a problem. We're trying to ignite something in them that gets them to hunger for truth, you know, in a more significant way and is able to overcome the disorientation to do that. Right. So that's really kind of white yeah. away kind of language and white and white lies. What I'm trying to say is once that light bulb comes out, once you say it's real, it's bad, I have to do something about it. Right. Like that's where the conversation shifts. Um, you know, and so I just want to make that distinction because most people don't go from, I'm not thinking about this to wanting to be woke in one move. You know, it really, it really represents almost a different space that we're in. But once you get a white person who is aware of the fact that race is real, the white supremacy is real, that they long to be on the right side of this. One of the things I've observed over, I've observed over and over and over again is that, there's there's a misconception that's an important one that forms inside of us in terms of like how we think we should show up, especially in, in spaces with people of color, with leaders of color. Most white people pick up uh, a, a message that, again, I think is totally wrong, but I'll name the wrongness first. It's what's kind of captured this word woke. Um, what most of us internalize is that what makes me valid to show up in these spaces with other people of color, with other leaders of color, is that I need to prove that I get it, that race is bad. I get it that racism is real and I'm not one of them, 
right? Like I've yeah. outgrown that. I've, I've distanced myself from that. I've condemned that. I'm on the side of the good people. I'm on the side of the allies. We think that's how we should show up. And we come in big, right? Like, and we're pretty certain. And, and that to me, that's what's largely capturing this idea of woke. Part of woke is good, right? We should be conscious always. We should always be growing more conscious. But so much of the dark side of woke, and I should also add this, a lot of people don't even like that word anymore. We're going to outgrow it quickly. Mm -hmm. That's fine. It's not the word itself that's important, but we'll have a synonym that's the exact same thing as soon as woke is no longer used. So I think it's a valid conversation even after woke goes out. Um, it, It gets to the idea that white people have that in order to be relevant and accepted and validated, I need to show up as somebody who gets it, who proves that I'm on the right side of this, that I'm one of the good guys on this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so I'm, yeah. Go ahead. Oh no, keep going. Keep going. Um, yeah. So all I'm, I, what I'm trying to help people do is to say, ironically, maybe that's not even the right word. There's actually few things you can do that break trust more significantly with people of color, with leaders of color than trying to show up as the white person who thinks they're free of this because we don't, we don't see that as a form of pride. We see it as a, as a form of like demonstrating solidarity, um, with, with the cause, but it's actually, it's a form of pride because what we're basically saying is look, three years ago, I was that person who had no idea that this was even real. And now I've read enough Buzzfeed articles and enough, you know, watched enough documentaries that I kind of get this. And so now I'm on the right side. And so, so we mistake kind of the early stages of really understanding this thing with being ready to really join up when instead, I think, what we discover is that the reasons we didn't see in the first place are reasons that are part of our whole life, right? Like to be white is to be shielded from most of the blunt reality of what white supremacy is. And so it's important to continue to learn about it, but the learned experience is not the same thing as the lived experience. They're just two entirely different bodies of information. And so when we try to show up as, as allies or, you know, accomplices, whatever word gets used, because we've got some learned experience and actually discredits in a lot of ways, the lived experience of those who have been under the subjugation of white supremacy for their whole lives. So bottom line, we just need to come humbly. We need to come and say, th- this is the language we use at our church. The question should never be, um, have I been affected by the lie? Like, did I internalize the lie of white supremacy? The, 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 the starting point should be, of course, like it's in the air we breathe. This lies everywhere. Of course, it's inside of me. My starting point is not, is it inside of me? My starting point is how deep is it inside of me? Or where is it still inside of me that I don't know, right? And we won't actually know that outside of the context of cross-cultural community where you know people are authorized to kind of highlight for that for us. And so it's, it's, it's a grueling journey in a little bit. It's also a liberating journey in another way, because if you really see what's from a lie, which is what I'm convinced it is, it's, it's, a, it's a very carefully constructed set of lies. Lies always detract from our best selves. Right? Lies always steal life from us. And so if we're gripped by a lie, I think we all want to get rid of it, right? So that's kind of the opposite of wokeness. Like to, to be woke should just be to say, I've got a lie inside of me and that terrifies me. And so that's my starting point. Not yeah. <laughs> I get it and I'm on the right side of thing. It's that this lie is real. It's inside of me. I'm terrified of it. I want to be around folks who will help me continue to get free of it as we collectively all try to do the work to confront it in society. That's uh, that's really helpful. I mean, I think I think that is the impulse, right? Um, the, the sort of impulse that says, okay, so these things are happening, so I'm going to name them as wrong. And it's easy to get your, right. uh, your social badge um, and not really right. confront the internalized supremacy that right. takes a lifetime, I would assume, to thoroughly purge from... Right. I, I mean, we're swimming in that water, as you as you say. So that that's a really helpful invitation. And you know, you you kind of already mentioned like um, you know multiracial community spaces. And another lie that you talk about is diversity and how mm-hmm. that gets framed. Because you say you've got to beware when we talk diversity. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd be curious if uh, you can help us understand, because I think that's the, the solution a lot of people jump to in Christianity. It's right. like, I oh, our church is too white. So what we need to do is get some black and brown folks here and right. it'll all be fine. And, and I feel like there's a deeper, deeper thing that folks um, ought to be invited into that's beyond diversity. And so I'd love to hear you unpack, um, beware of diversity. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right. I think white churches do the same thing that white individuals do, actually, honestly, that they go for their whole life without even realizing that race is a problem, without re- without ever naming white supremacy is, is this kind of sinful system that must be confronted and <laughs> uprooted. And then, you know, a light bulb turns on, right? And um, individuals and churches kind of do the same thing. They say, oh, shoot, you know, um, race is a problem in my life or my church is totally segregated. Um and then it's just interesting. What we don't do is say, how did I somehow live my whole life never realizing this was a problem? And what may be the wreckage that comes with the fact that I've never thought about this, particularly in a church space, right? Like, like what is all so woven into the way we do things now that we've always been an all-white church that you know, wasn't really even capable of reaching other kind of people that basically like was complicit in different ways with white supremacy. Instead of asking that, we say, how do we go from being a completely segregated church to being a racially diverse church? as if that in itself will solve the problem. And so it's it's really, I think, as simple as saying, um, if you come to realize that white supremacy is a problem, diversity can be a very powerful tool, right? Like it's obvious, it, it just, it's logic, right? A multiracial group of people is gonna be much better positioned to attack white supremacy than a homogenous group of white people being able to attack white supremacy. So I'm certainly not against diversity at all. I think there's an enrichment that can come from diversity and an ability to carry out Christ's mission <laughs> In society, um, I yeah. think it's, it's, it's really enhanced and intensified um, in a diverse setting. It just comes down almost to the language of a means versus an end. Um, if diversity is seen as an end, that just shows we still don't understand white supremacy, right? That that we have always been in a white-centric world that was completely disconnected from this stuff, but we can suddenly just start adding people from different backgrounds without really ever changing anything, right? That that's That's viewing diversity as an end, that if I can just move from a hundred percent white to 80 percent white we've done our work right instead of saying no the end is white supremacy is evil jesus christ is trying to confront and dismantle that that comes with praying thy kingdom come that will be done on earth as in heaven and therefore diversity is necessary in order to more effectively address and confront this evil right like if you're in that second one diversity can be really helpful in the first one diversity becomes really painful for people of color because they they assume that when you say you want diversity it's because you want to have conversations around white supremacy but when they discover that you never actually intended to talk about white supremacy you just wanted to keep doing church as you were doing it you just wanted more different kinds of people there it, it tends to be a real heartbreaking reality for people yeah yeah no that that thoroughly makes sense and I, I'd be curious if you were to put on a church consultant hat for a moment and you, you know, you encountered a homogenous white church that says, we know that we are off here. Like we, we know that we've been dipping our toes into white supremacy, um, maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly, whatever. Uh, but now we're in that disoriented phase and want mm-hmm. to move towards something. Our impulse is let's get more folks of other races in the building. Um, mm-hmm. My question for you is, are you somewhat saying like, no, actually do the work and then see what kind of grows out of the fact that you've done the work so that you can do uh, you know, possibly cultivate a diverse community in a healthy way. Like, is that, yeah. is that maybe part of the pathway? Yeah, I think so. Or if, if, if I'll tell a story, it kind of gets to the same idea from a little bit different. I was meeting with a pastor here in the Chicago suburbs area. It's, it's, it's a fast growing, this was before COVID when people actually got to come to church, but it's a fast growing campus yeah. church. And, um, you know, I think they have four campuses at the time I met with them and, um, all four were growing fast, all white, but, um, he had had this kind of racial awakening and I, I believe he was sincere about it. And so, you know, they had already started trying to diversify and were experiencing success, success there, but he actually, to his credit, realized I have to go beyond that. And so he said, we realized the next stage is, um, it's at our employees at our staff level. And so we've made a commitment to like, not only be 20% diverse at a congregational attendance level, but to be 20% diverse at a staff level and to be conscientious, not just at support staff, but like at leadership, you know, which there, there's a lot of validity talking about that. So he was, he, they, they had made a few hires. They still hadn't hired anybody African-American. They were really trying to hire somebody African-American. There was somebody they were talking to, but he was really hesitant. So he was trying to gain insight. And he said, you know, what can I do to pitch him on this, you know? And so I said to him, so tell me, when he gets on staff, what do you hope he'll do? And he actually hadn't thought about that much. He just wanted yeah. this guy to kind of carry out whatever anybody else. And so he said that, but he kind of caught himself and realized that's not a very thoughtful answer. He said, well, I hope, I hope that... I mean, he would be part of the pastoral leadership team. So I hope he would help us to reveal blind spots too, um, both at a leadership level and at a church level. Right? And I said, okay, so let's play that out. 
he says at a staff level, he sees some of the ways that your church culture is complicit with white supremacy. How do you respond to that? And like, he got like a lump in his throat. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't know. I said, now what about if that black pastor is invited to preach? And he talks about the ways the congregation is complicit with white supremacy. And then it's with the pastor. And I appreciate his honesty. This is not, now we're actually there. He said, he can't say, he said, I can't say the term white supremacy in front of my church. I'd lose a quarter of my church if I said the term white supremacy in front yeah. of my church. So I said, so can we just have an honest conversation? You're trying to bring a black pastor into an environment where if you as the founding white senior pastor said white supremacy from up front, you'd lose people, but you're hoping he will come in and help your church see yeah. white supremacy, right? Wow. Like you see, you're, signing, you're, you're, you're recruiting him for a death sentence. You, do you not see that? So I want to affirm your notion that you're seeing that this has to go beyond just cosmetic diversity to the point where leadership is even reflecting that. But, but why? Like what – why has there never been a black person here before? And what's going to happen when he comes in? He's going to see things that you don't see, right? So like, that's what you should look like when you're ready to have that conversation with the pastoral staff where what he sees, you're ready to hear when he can get up in front of that church alongside of you. But really, you should have preached on white supremacy long before he preaches on white supremacy. Right? Exactly. So it all yeah. depends what y'all trying to do here, right? So if you just want some black bodies that will kind of quietly go along with things, I mean, you know, I think you already know that's not the answer to this, right? So I think with this reframing, you can probably start thinking differently, like of where your church needs to be before somebody like him can come in. Like you basically honestly said, you guys aren't ready for him and it would be dangerous mm -hmm. and irresponsible for you to recruit him at this point. So the question then becomes, what can you do as the founding white senior pastor that would take your church on a theological journey that somebody like him could eventually come in? Like, that's the kind of thing I would say helps us think about this differently. Yeah, that's wow. That's a really powerful story, and I hope hope folks that are listening, especially those who are in, you know, fairly white homogenous spaces, that um, when it comes to church and maybe in leadership, that hopefully they can um, take those uh, conversations that you just shared and adapt them. Because I, I think there's just a lot of wisdom there, and I appreciate a lot of that. And I, you know, as we we keep going through here, I'm wondering, you know. Telling the truth, mm -hmm. you know, this idea of speaking the truth to power, the idea of telling the truth when it's hard. Um, I think this is another big hurdle for a lot of my white, you know, fellow white friends um, when it comes to, especially I think of family dynamics, but even beyond that. And so I'm curious um, if you would speak to some of those uh challenges and to why, you know, the practice that we're invited into is telling the truth. Yeah. It's, this is one of those, it's like, there's a part of this that's real easy. And there's a part of this that's real hard. The easy part should be, I mean, like telling the truth should just be one of the central foundations that Christians of all backgrounds should be able to rally around. Right. <laughs> I mean, the fact that Jesus calls himself truth multiple times, right. That there's freedom. Exactly. Like that should be the one thing, like, you know, we might have different understandings how to get there or, you know, priorities and like that, but truth should be what binds us all together, right? That should just be an unshakable thing. And here's what's ironic. In most white Christian spaces, telling the truth is celebrated in most arenas, yeah. right? For a, like, let's again, let's just go conserve because it makes the point a little bit simpler. In a, in a typical evangelical space, if you have a tell the truth Sunday about the sanctity of life, yeah, like even with that being a politicized issue, even with that being a social justice issue, that's going to be celebrated. Yep. Right. If you have a tell the truth weekend around the dangers of pornography and sexuality outside the way it's meant to be used, you're not going to get pushback on that, even though it's a, a sensitive charge topic. Right. Tell the mm -hmm. truth Sunday is going to be celebrated as you know. I, but if you have in the typical white evangelical space, at least a tell the truth Sunday about race, about white supremacy, you are not going to get that same reaction that you got in the other ones. You're going to get defensiveness. You're going to get questions of motivation. You're going to get angry emails. You're going to get people threatening to leave. I know many pastors who had actually one more than that. Like one series on this was enough to like break their church. Wow. And so I think it like, I think it literally really raises this like haunting question of why can white Christians happily tell the truth about a lot of different subject matters, even that are politicized and social in nature. And yet when the subject matter switches to race and to white supremacy, the, the entire disposition changes, right? The ability yeah. to hear truth objectively, to pursue Jesus in it, it almost goes out the window, honestly. And that, that what white, what white awake did for me, because I've been traveling a lot more since white awake. So I've been able to visit all these Christian colleges and churches and across the country. You know, I've just been doing like once a month, you know, with my church, but mm -hmm. you know, done that each month for the last three years. What I've discovered, that's the, that's the singular lament 
by leaders of color in Western spaces up and down the country is that white Christians want to seek truth on every subject matter except when it comes to race. Wow. When you try to tell the truth about race, they shut you down, call you names, kick you out, discredit mm-hmm. you. There is this almost universal response that's frightening. And I think we have to like really sit with it. Like why something as simple as like, I'm not talking even opinion or conjecture, like something as simple as saying, this has been around, this is how it's operated, this is how it's expressed itself, here's some of the fallout from it. Like, even those basic levels of kind of telling truth and then trying to explore how Jesus would, would have us respond to that is a very threatening thing to the typical white Christian. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it's unfortunate. I mean, I have a, a personal friend who basically lost his job after doing a series on this topic. I mean, it's... It's not unheard of, that's for sure. And, um, you know, and, and it, it begs questions of those who uphold leadership environments where this is risky, but also um, for those who sit in the pews, right? Like everyone's yeah. part of this, everyone's complicit in this. And the, we've really got to shift our imagination beyond um, talking points, beyond you said this, therefore all of this other political baggage isn't, you know, isn't important to you anymore or is important to you. And that's a problem. You like Hillary, Biden, whatever, you know, whatever little bite they can, it's, 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 it's a hard, hard, um, space, uh, whether it's in family friendship circles or the church itself. So, um, I, I want to kind of move towards, uh, our, our closing here because I, I love the fact that you close out the book with repentance. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I can imagine that there are forms <laughs> of re- repentance that are healthy and uh, humanizing to our, um, you know, um, brothers and sisters of color, et cetera. Uh, and then there's, you know, so there could be good and there can be some really self-serving repentance, air quote, you know? And so I'm curious, like talk about why the practice of repentance is central to the discipleship journey as we dismantle white um, white uh, supremacy. Yeah, it's probably one of the subject matters that people get most charged when I talk about because it kind of hints at that we're all racist at some level and people don't like that hint. And so it's, it's often not received mm. it's greatly as you're receiving it. Um, but I'm glad that lands well for you too. I mean, for me, yeah. I think a lot of us have too small of a view of repentance just in general. We think of it as something that's dreary, you know, and like, kind of like you're grinding a little bit, like having to confess all things you did wrong. Um, I think for a lot of us, when we think of repentance, we almost exclusively think of behaviors, right? So it's confessing the things we've done wrong, which I mean, certainly repentance would include that. But as you know, right, it's such a beautiful Greek word, metanoia, right? Mm-hmm. And meta being part of every wonderful English transformation word we have, metamorphosis, whatever, about cat- caterpillar turn to a butterfly. Noia, it's not exactly thinking, but it kind of gets to how we interface with the world, kind of almost like the, the, the idea of a worldview, how we process reality, mm-hmm. right? So repentance is actually a transformation of how we view things, of how we think, right? We get the same more pensive that we get from repent, right? It changes kind of how we think and see things in the world. And so just even in general, outside of race, there's not a word that's probably more liberating to me than repentance, uh, because it's not just about cataloging all the things I've done wrong. When I think of repentance, I think of it as like when the Apostle Paul says, we need to have the mind of Christ, right? That like Christ sees the world in a certain kind of way. I don't see it that way, but he wants me to see it that way. So part of why I repent of my bad deeds, among other things, is part of a larger problem that I don't see him purely. I don't see the kingdom the way that I should see it. So repentance to me is about a starting point of saying, I don't have the mind of Christ and I want the mind of Christ. And that it's a liberation term, right? Repentance is a liberation Mm -hmm. term of saying, I'm trying to get free of bad ways of thinking about the world and be brought into this much more robust and whole and a live way of seeing the world. So that, just in general, that's why that word means a lot. When it comes to race, and we've you know developed the idea much more in the book, but we've quickly talked here that white supremacy is built on a set of lies, which I think is important to say, because though there's all kinds of actions and systems that come from that, at the heartbeat of race is this set of lies. And of course, lies is the most drastic contrast to the mind of Christ, right? The mind of Christ will always take us to truth. Lies will always take us in literally the opposite direction of truth. And so to repent of white supremacy is not to me to repent of calling people bad names or ostracizing somebody or discriminating, though if for the handful of people that that's happened, of course, we should repent for that too. It's much more about recognizing that there's this atmosphere of lies that's all around us that organizes our reality 
and orders our reality around these lies of human value with the superiority of whiteness and the inferiority of blackness. And so it's a daily admission, just in the same way when Jesus says, I've not come to heal the healthy, but I've come for, for the, I'm not coming to heal the healthy, I've come for the sick, right? And the Pharisees couldn't respond to that because they didn't see themselves as sick. Yeah. Like, I think if we don't see ourselves as sick by lies, we won't ever see the need for Jesus to redeem us. But if we see that the atmosphere is being laced with these kind of toxic lies about human values that tied to the system of race, then daily we realize that we need to be saved from that. We need to be liberated from that. We need to be freed from that. And so I think it's almost a no duh once you see the reality of lies and the redemption path that Jesus offers us. But if you don't see either side of that, it's, it feels threatening because what it feels like what we're saying is that you're a racist and until you admit you're a racist, you know, Jesus love you or something. And so we, we missed the larger point, but for me, it's a very liberative um, transformational word uh, to think of daily trying to get free of the lies of race that are all around me. Yeah, that's wow. That's well, that's so well said. And for me, uh, I think that's a great framework for thinking about repentance. You know, we often think about the hyper individualistic, which we need to. Uh, there are moments where I need to repent for, you know, things related to white supremacy and things related to how I treated my kids. You know, <laughs> it's it, it, there are personal matters that Jesus right. wants to hear about and is open to and is gracious to walk us through. And then there's the waters we swim in and the blind spots and, you know, the, the big paradigmatic things and the, the invitation of the gospel to literally turn around, like to really experience that spiritual metamorphosis that you described and that being an ongoing process. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the way you framed this book and for the work you're doing. And what I wanted to do was give you an opportunity to point folks towards, of course, they can find the book on their favorite bookseller, right? White Lies, that's something mm -hmm. they can find. Yeah. But but Daniel, where can they find other work you're doing if they wanted to just track with, um, yeah, your other projects and beyond? On social media, I'm at Daniel Hill 1336 1336. So on Instagram and Twitter, um, I've got a, a website at pastordanielhill.com where kind of everything is rooted through. So um, those would be some easy places to find me. Great, great. Well, hey, I, I just want to thank you for being on the show and for bringing wisdom and insight to something that has always been an issue, but many folks are starting to see it for the first time. And so having resources like your books and other resources that are out there, I think are just real gifts to the body of Christ. So I'm really grateful for that and hope to have you back on the show um, next time you write a book or for other, other topics that may come up. Uh, thanks, Kurt. It's really been an honor to be with you. Appreciate your work. Thanks for listening to Theology Curator. For more resources from Kurt Willems, check out theologycurator.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for our email update list. For new listeners of the podcast, we hope you will subscribe via iTunes, Google, or your podcast manager of choice. If you like what you hear, please leave the show a review. For regular listeners, consider supporting Kurt's online ministry at patreon.com forward slash Kurt Willems. Lastly, please don't let this conversation end when the episode is over. We hope you feel empowered in regular life to explore theology and faith in intelligent and humanizing ways.